He's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with over 26 years of experience. Together, we're the Brief Brothers. We love to talk about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. Henry, we're back with another episode. Today, we have a gentleman from St. Louis. His name is Paul McFarlane. He's been one of our biggest supporters, and he's going to introduce himself. Let's join the conversation. All right, Henry, we're back. Today, we have a special guest. I mean, all our guests are special from, from my perspective, but... But Paul McFarlane is joining us today. He's, he's in and about St. Louis, although he just intimated to me that his heart and soul is in the Netherlands, and he may fill us in on all that in a minute. But Paul is one of our, there we go. Paul is, is actually one of our bigger fans. He has commented on our, uh, our, our YouTube page. He has followed us on LinkedIn. He's given some comments. He is a devotee of the brief, so we'll be able to talk to him about that. So, Paul. Welcome to the Brief Brothers. We appreciate you joining us. Well, hello. It's good to be alive. So why don't you take a moment and give us a little background. I know that you your, your LinkedIn page and your website uh, tout you as a brand strategist with uh, decades of experience with some major brands. Tell us a little bit about more about what you do and your background. Okay. Well, my value proposition is this. Global Fortune 500 experience to bring the very best of humanity forward. And I'm really serious about that, bringing the best of humanity forward, the best qualities, what it means to be human and show brands how they can do that in their way to make shit tons of money. And what kind of brands have I been doing that either by subconsciously or consciously? Well, I usually do them alphabetically because that's the way I kind of put it in. Anheuser-Busch, Apple, Audi, the city of Aspen, Levi's, Manchester United, McDonald's, Mercedes-Benz, Microsoft, NATO, uh -huh, Nissan, Puma, Smart Car, U.S. State Department, United Nations, Volvo. Those are the ones everybody would know. Those are some impressive. major brands. Yeah, that's very impressive. Um, what, what got you started in this, in this line of work? What drew well, you to it? I know exactly. When I was a little kid, I would stand at the chalkboard with a piece of chalk, and there's got to be a way to draw a line that goes back in space, and it drove me crazy. And when I was in kindergarten, um, I would get the work done, flip the paper over, and start drawing something. You know, so I won awards for poetry uh, in first grade, uh, and everyone assumed I was going to be a commercial artist. They were sure of that, although I had no effing idea what that meant at that time. And, uh, and when I went to uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and the key day was when I was, it was March 4th, because I can remember everything in my life <laughs> by the day, uh, I went into the library of the graphic designers. See, I was an illustration major. I was a kid in the art school, could actually draw. But I always wrote too, right? And like the great argument, so the story thickens. I went into the library and I thought, well, I'm supposed to be an illustrator? I don't know. I looked at a CA, 1980 CA, at illustration annual. Oh, shit. Oh, I don't do anything. I, I don't think I could. I don't think, I, oh, oh, crap. Boom, boom, boom. And then there was a photography one because I was doing a lot of darkroom kind of interesting things well before Photoshop, you know, where I would take multiple shots, you know, and then sand the, you know, the prints back really thin, cut them out, glue them, re-photograph it, hand tint them, do all these futuristic Led Zeppelin kind of inspired things. And I looked at that book and was like, well, that's interesting, but uh, I, no, no, oh God, this is bad. And I found a, in this order, a graphic design annual and I thought, well, this is a little bit more like, but it was a little cold. You know, it was designed, but it didn't have, and I picked up an advertising annual, 1980. And it was just like trumpets and angels. There it was. It's writing, it's thinking, it's design, it's the human race, creativity. That was it. So I literally, right there, because that's when you had to have a, uh, a code to put in the copier <laughs> and a code for long distance phone calls. We may get to that. I started making copies of my favorite ads and I put them in a binder. And I when it got to be about half an inch thick, I remember spending time looking at it 
And almost every ad that I was saving was from one agency. I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. So I got to the dean's office and knew the code for long distance, called Los Angeles, and I heard, good morning, Shia Day. I'm sorry, who is this? Shia Day, thank you. Now I know how to say it. <laughs> Off I went. So that's, that's a great story. That's how, how it happened, exactly. Okay. Um, I'm stuck on one thing that's a little tangential, so forgive me. You went to the, you you studied where again? University of Wisconsin, Washington, 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 St. Louis. Louis. St. Louis. So and you you studied poetry. So did you read or did you know or did you read the poetry of Howard Nemiroff? Oh gosh, Howard Nemiroff. Yeah. Um, he was an institution there, as far I as know, I, know. I know. But it wasn't like I mean I appreciate but didn't love. I mean, see, okay. at WashU, I was an uh, an art student. But I got really crappy grades in the art school because they were all pushing modern art and I don't really go for much modern art. And I took classes in art history and English literature and whatnot. And I took, you know, that's where my Northern European affectation really started to grow. I took a class of panel painting in Northern Europe in the 16th century. Uh-huh. Got straight A's in that. <laughs> so I, I'm going to go on something tangential too. You said you have this ability to remember specific days in, in your life. Yep. And are you familiar with the Mary Lou Henner on Letterman story? Yes. So for those who may not know, Mary Lou Henner, actress, she was on the TV show uh, Taxi, uh, very famous in her day. She was on David Letterman's show and she claimed that, you know, she could remember Pretty much if you told her some a date, she could tell you what she was doing on that day. And so Letterman asked her, you know, July 20th, 1969, and she turned red and she said, who put you up to this? And of course, he asked her because it was the lunar landing. Yeah. And she said, that's the day I lost my virginity. <laughs> Another kind of well, I, I knew the I knew the, the lunar landing part about it. I didn't know about the virginity part. Yeah, well, neither me. neither did uh, the viewing public <laughs> that was scandalized <laughs> that day to learn when Mary Lou Henner lost her virginity on the day that man was landing on the moon. There were a lot of people who were having parties for that night. I think that's why. But let me make this clear: I can, but I don't look back very often. I'm going this way. Mm. Well, I, I appreciate your love of poetry because that's something that I, I share with you. I, I studied poetry in undergraduate and graduate school and, you know, met some, I've written, did a lot of writing of poetry back in the day. I don't do it anymore. Oh. And my, my writing, my writing today is all about looking back. I'm a memoirist. I've written a creative brief as a poem before. I think that'd be a great idea. I think I've advocated with Henry, who sometimes agrees with this idea that a, a, great, a great creative brief could be a letter from the consumer to the creative department. Be anything. I mean, I usually say a, a brief is an ad to the creative team. However, yeah. the most important thing I think in a brief is not who writes it, but who it's written for. Because yeah. a great brief given to an idiot won't make any difference. And a great brief written to a genius is unnecessary. Yeah. You know, we we had a, we've had a couple of conversations on LinkedIn and maybe just through email about your contention that you write a single sentence for a brief. For a creative brief, yes. Talk, uh, to, me. Talk to us more about a one sentence because I've never seen one. And what's the distinction? Oh, okay. Let's assume we have a team, an agency team, a client team. There usually is some kind of fear of making sure we don't screw up or we didn't miss anything. So you need a strategic brief that kind of puts in writing in case anyone ever needs to look it up to punish the guilty afterwards of what we said we were trying to do, our situation, our competition, all those things. That can still be done very simply, but it's, it's usually it's like, what, where are we aiming for you know, a strategic brief? When you get to a creative brief, it just needs to be inspiring and digestible. It's like any brand. If you can't express it in 10 seconds, it's probably not going to be digestible and spreadable. So um, one of my favorite things, see, and I got to understand, I do the brief in my head as I'm writing. Because when I'm doing it, something myself, I'm not doing a brief for myself, I think as a brief. I'll give you an example. Um, last year, I was on a Zoom call 
with a colleague and a client who had a skincare product. Have you heard that there are skincare brands out there? Yes, you can actually open a window, close your eyes and throw a rock and you'll hit a new skincare brand, which is good because that means a new one doesn't have to tell people what's it for, but you got to differentiate, right? So anyway, this woman, she's talking about bottle line ingredients yeah, yeah, and, and the name of it. Um, and I will disclaim, if you go to the website for this thing, I had almost nothing to do with it and I don't like it. But the brand name is called Hedo, H-E-D-O, from the Greek meaning? Pleasure, I don't know what it is. Pleasure, hedonism, pleasure, hedonism. right? Hedonism, okay. I mean, what I'm about to tell you in however many minutes took place in about three seconds in my brain. Hedo, pleasure, skincare. Where do you use skincare products? When we're naked, in private. Okay, so the brief is already formed, but I'll tell you what the brief is after I tell you how I came up with the line. How would you express that? Hmm, okay, line. Ooh, that's good. Uh, uh, now the second one. Hedo, your other significant other. Pretty catchy. The brief is in that. Hedo should behave like a wise desirous lover there's your brief and once you know that you know how you should speak you know how it should look you know how it should feel very cool yeah there's your example i do it all yeah. the time. that's a good one right so yeah, that's for a... us mere mortals <laughs> um we use techniques to try to be able to replicate or, or, or stimulate our thinking. You know, I think part of the, the, the writing of a brief is simply just the setting aside of that time to think about the problem and, and put it into perspective and meditate on it. Um, and like I said, it, it requires either, you know, some amount of, of genius, like I think you just demonstrated, or, you know, you have to practice and, and some sort of process. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm not going to uh, uh, plead guilty to being genius. So I, I rely on process and, and, and repetition. Remember what I said? I was doing the brief as I was coming up the line. That's what it's all about. You can do the process in any kind of form you like, and ideas will come at the same time. Sometimes the idea says, oh, that should be our brief. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And, and remember, who is it for? And, and, and truth be told, sometimes you kind of come up with it right away without looking at any of the research or any of that thing. And then the more you look at the research, you, you're almost trying to talk yourself out of what your idea was, right? You're, you're like, well, I shouldn't just go for that. That was my first idea. It can't be the best idea, but sometimes, and, I, and I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes um, it is, it, uh, you know, follow that instinct. Um, but I, 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 on the flip side, I kind of also see sometimes, especially in creative work, when I'm reviewing creative work, that the first iteration of creative work is usually kind of the obvious answers, the things that aren't that. And, and I have this anecdote about like stand-up comedians. And I, and I talk about it, I've said it before, but I can't remember who the comedian was that said it. I'm, I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy and not just, watching it and laughing but also like i'm i kind of like knowing about the the business of stand-up comedy and this comedian was talking about the writing process and saying that um you know let's say something happens in the world and everybody's talking about it and you come up with that joke normally that joke that you come up with is the joke everybody else is going to come up with and then you kind of go back to the drawing board and you you the second joke is a little bit more personal, maybe a little bit of a different spin, but it's usually that third iteration where now it's something completely unique. That's completely you and your view and your style on that thing. And so, uh, you know, I don't know where I land. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you can hit lightning in a bottle, right. With that initial first thought, 
but I think also the the iterative process of thinking and and kind of and writing and rewriting a creative brief also helps to get to something better than if you just went with your first gut instinct. Absolutely, for many people. And the thing about the magic of that, I think, Henry, is you, you've all heard or been in the situation where there is a brief and a team just keeps passing around. Oh, I know there's got to be something here. No one's getting anything from it. You do it like that. And it's more childlike and pure, I think. Well, you know, Cameron Day, who was a guest we talked about earlier, he says that when he gets an assignment and he's he's been a freelancer mm -hmm. lately, but he's done the, you know, the executive creative director, the chief creative officer gigs in the past. But as a freelancer, what he says is I'll get a brief and I'll rewrite it. He calls it his mantra. Now, I don't know if it's a sentence. I think it's more than a sentence. He said it can sometimes be a paragraph. So when you're doing these one sentence briefs, which as you've described them do, as Henry said, they sound pure genius, but it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're writing it for yourself. If you were to bring in a freelance team, would they need more than a single sentence? Well, again, if you're bringing in a team, is the brief- Who knows nothing about, who's not, who knows nothing about the brand? Right, well, it will see. Skincare is pretty duh, if you think about it. Goo, you rub in your body. But the point is, if you're bringing in a team, does that mean I'm sending them an email they're supposed to read, or am I talking to them? You see, I would, if I was bringing a team to work on that, I'd literally say what I told you guys. I would say, okay, this is a skincare clan. They're called Hito. Kind of means pleasure. Where do you use skincare? And just wait for them to go, or we're naked and wait for them to say something. Yeah, there you go, there's your brief. We're gonna be that lover, that significant other. We're gonna speak this product as if, in fact, may I tell you what it's like when you get the product? This is when you show where the brief works. When you get the product, it's like, um, well, the box is part of the undressing like your lover, you know? But when you get into the box where the product is, it's like an iPhone box, so pulls out the heavy thing. On the inside is a boudoir, picture kind of black and white and you look down the box it's not the bottle or the jar there's a perfectly set in there a little brochure but all the paper is uh soft touch laminate you know what that is it's that real grippy stuff almost feels like rubber so if it gets wet it's okay but that little brochure in there is it instructions or ingredients nope it's love poetry written to the person who's look reading it as if they are that wise lover about them, about the desire for them and about the product and how it relates to that. So we already got some videos of people opening like, what the heck is this? Oh, I'm putting that aside, you know? So it's, it's what I always say is innovate the mundane, take the most ordinary thing and bring the brand to that all the way, all the way, all the way. And then you've got something. When would you, uh, when would, when would a single sentence not work for you? Well, the thing is a paragraph works, a page works, but there's something very digestible and spreadable about one sentence. I mean, imagine if Nike had said, just do it because if you don't just do it, you may never do it. And if you never do it, you know, it may not travel as well. And you need to infect the team. You got to make sure everyone on the team, even the client, even the executive creative director, global, whatever, it's on their lips. And that gives them a chance when it's that short. That's why I, I, I say a strategic brief is fine for people who want to see what did we say we were going to do in the first place? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's fine. But a creative brief just to kind of impregnate. What, one of the things that fascinates me about your background, I did a quick read of your, your website, oh, yeah. is, is um, you, your love of art, your love of writing, your love of books. Are you a, you're, you're, a, you're an art, you're an art, your background is art, so you're, a, you're an artist more than a writer, or would you say you're both? I'm both, and that's very difficult in this world where you have to be specialists, but for our conversation, yeah, I'm both. And I do think both at the same time. Uh, do you have a preference? No. 
I consider type to be art. And if you've seen any of my posts on LinkedIn, I kern the F out of things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, I will remove the dots from the eyes and reshape the dot and lower them because, because I think it looks better that way. When did, when did the whole idea of working with a brief uh, become problematic for you? First time I was working with an idiot. <laughs> and an idiot, I mean the word seriously from the Greek idiote. Idiote was a person in the Greek society who did not share and participate in public politics. So they didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. It's a person who doesn't know what's going on in the larger sense, micro, micro. And the thing is, when you realize you've got something fluid and electric lightning in the bottle, right? In the jar, and you want to share that with someone else and they put up barriers, then it gets more complicated, not complex, but complicated. Mm -hmm. Some things can be beautifully complex, but complicated sucks. And when you have to, instead of taking something mobile and agile and fluid and disseminate that and say everything in the sexual Congress, uh, and you have to do something more protracted and clunky just to serve someone where they are, that sucks. And then it gets complicated. Then that's when I first started. That was in January 1987 in a client meeting, um, second week of December, where I'm not trying to flaunt. It's just the way I think about it. The, the room was like, we went in there like just like this, you know, and you think you got it, and it's like, and then some, and your main client gets it, but their boss and their boss comes in and suddenly and they derail it, right? But they were derailing it simply because they rejected the simplicity and wanted the binder. And as a human trait, remember binders, five inch binders of research. And the first time you have a client where you spend two months doing all the research and you give it to them, they go, hmm. Good work and they put it aside and you know they never look at it but then someone down the line is holding that because i can't get fired because it was in the research just like now it's in the data you know i get it so i mean i'm just more selective now and if i have someone who is really important in the process i have to work with them directly which is why a lot of the fortune 500 clients i've worked with i've been in the room with the ceo yeah, so you describe, I think, a state of affairs which probably encompasses 95% of marketers in America. Um, mm -hmm. You know, big brands, big organizations, a lot of idiots, um, a lot of uh, people cl clinging to the data and the binders. You know, I actually wrote a piece recent, uh, not recently, I wrote a piece that's on LinkedIn. It was not recent about you know, creative pre-testing. And it's a fig leaf, right? To say, well, the focus groups liked it, right? But that's not going to stop you from getting fired when you, like, it's an abdication of your responsibility as a marketer to turn over marketing decisions to a group of randomly recruited people that have no background in marketing, don't know your brand, don't know what your objectives are. Um, and then think, that when the campaign flops or doesn't do anything, doesn't move the needle, that somehow that's going to, well, the focus groups liked it. Well, the focus groups didn't fucking buy the product. You know what I mean? Like they, they just didn't. So um, yeah, I, I, it's a sad, and I honestly, I just don't know that there's any solution uh, to the problem. I, the only solution is you can keep on keeping on, never give in. Yeah, never yeah. So, so the way I see it is, it's like a bell curve. And I, and I think a lot of people, a lot of situations can be easily described with a bell curve, which is. I draw one of these three times a day because <laughs> everything in life is a bell curve. So you, if you have haters, I can turn them into lovers. Lovers, I can turn to haters. The people up here, I can't do anything with. So the, so the bell curve, I, you know, I, I said 95% of, of marketers, you know, the 5% are the one extreme end of really good marketers. There's a lot of average marketers in that. And then there are just some people that shouldn't be in the business. But I, I think the only way to have any sort of um, uh, peace of mind about the whole situation is just to keep shooting for catching those 5% clients, those, yeah. those ones that are prepared to 
talk about their brand, to not bullshit, to, that aren't afraid to make decisions, that are uh, willing to take a risk in order to re get a return, right? Because otherwise, there's no wonder that CFOs look at marketing as an expense and not an investment because you put X amount of money in and there's no tangible result. But, you know, then we see things that have an incredible, incredible ROI. Like I'm, I'm thinking just for example, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but it was a shave club though. The one with that launched Here with a, uh, what? No, not, what? What? Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club. Yeah. Launched launched with a viral video, right? That was really funny. Even copied, yeah. The the RO he ended up selling the company, I think, to Gillette, right, or to you know one of the big uh, package goods companies, for hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars. The ROI and probably cost him everything he had when he made that little viral video, but the ROI on that, what maybe was a $50,000 video to the billion dollar payoff when he sold the company um, because that put him on the map. It's a proof that communications advertising can still put a brand on the map. Um, I think that a lot of the advertising that we have from existing brands, it's just there. Like it's a reminder work. It's uh, We still exist. Hey, look at in, us. In, in one sentence, here's why that worked. It worked for the same reason than when originally Shy Day the first time brought Jack back. The same thing when the public needed a third party candidate that had some guts. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because what, what you do, Paul, and what Henry do, does are completely different from what I do. I used to be a working creative, so I used to be more along the lines of what you do now, Paul. But now what I'm doing is working with marketers for the most part who are asked and tasked with the responsibility of writing briefs. And that's really Henry's job. You know, the account planners and the strategists who've been trained. Now, Henry's self-taught. He, he's he's um, upfront about that. I think that's what makes him really good, by the way. Um, whereas the marketers that I deal with, they are going to fit in that bell curve like we're talking about. There are going to be some really good ones and there's going to be ones who need to find another line of work. But what we all recognize in the situation that they face is they're juggling multiple things, only one of which is to write a brief. And they're, you know, they deal with impossible deadlines, just like we all do, right? And I haven't had to face those in so many years. So I get to walk into these situations either virtually online when I teach or now that the travel is coming back and I'm loving that, working with them face-to-face. -face. And we have, to, we have to be careful how we teach what it is that they need to do because it's only one of many responsibilities. But the fact that they have a hard time, this is the biggest challenge that I face. They have a very hard time thinking like a creative. Right. And Henry, Henry, I think, because Henry has worked so closely with his creative department, uh, he's probably a lot more of a creative than he even thinks he is. But marketers have, there's something about a marketer who just gets lost in the weeds. And I was just doing a training. I can't tell you who it was with. It's an ANA member. So it was one of these, somewhere between a mom and a pop and a person. <coughs> And marketer after marketer would say to me, I'm just so lost in the weeds. I'm so drilling down into this and I'm forgetting that I need to inspire these guys. So asking them to write a one sentence brief, oh, would be wonderful, would be wonderful. But it does take a certain mentality, a certain mindset to be able to do that in the first place. Trying to get them to go from five pages to two mm -hmm. is almost asking too much. But I, 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 I appreciate clients like it, but it's not for everybody. Right, right. And you know, Bob Hoffman was our guest just recently. He's been on our show a couple of times now. He'll be, he'll be, his episode's coming up in a couple of weeks. His whole argument, maybe you've seen it on LinkedIn, is every brief should be make us famous. It's like, okay, yeah, that's three words. So he's even shorter than yours. That's not the brief. That should be the given understanding before you write the brief. It's well, I mentioned that, but he didn't agree with it. He said, that sounds like the strategy. He said, no, no. 
But any point, anyway, he, he's he, like you, he's like, let's get it down to really a nugget. Um, of course, there's nothing to distinguish one brand from the next, but just make us famous. Let's get back to you where your challenge is. Um, if you're working with creatures spawned on the bathroom floors of Wharton and Harvard Business School, and they're drilling down, they're drilling down, they're drilling down. It's like the modern way of thinking. You take everything of the mystery of life and boil it down to this one thing as if that is somehow the truth. But we're funny human beings. But that's what they're being assigned to do. And you're trying to help them, right? Well, if if you can at least define why you're doing a brief with them, you're, you've gotten somewhere. Is it something yeah. that a file? Like, like, like I call it a strategic brief to say, well, that's what we said we were going to do. It's defensive. Is it a defensive thing or is it an offensive thing? It you know, tends to be, it, hang on just a second, Henry. It tends to be, though, they, they are so focused on telling the creatives to do these tactics that they don't even do a strategy. And then we've had, we've had as our guest, Peter Paul Von Wheeler and Matt Davies, who are with betterbriefs.com. We talk about this a lot, and they did this global survey where they asked marketers what they thought about the quality of their briefs when advertising agencies, and the gap was like Grand Canyon. I think I write a great brief, say the marketers. Agencies, yeah, not so much. And one of the most revealing things that came from the survey was that, well, two things. 60% of marketers admitted that they used the creative process to figure out the strategy, and 9 out of 10 marketers admitted that they changed the brief after the creative has been briefed in. So Defense. how do you, how, yeah, exactly. But it's the strategic thing. And I see this all the time when I go out training. I don't know what the strategy is. We'll just do tactics. Just do this direct mail, do this social media, do the TV, whatever it is. And while we're looking at your work, maybe we'll figure out what the strategy should be. So it's getting them to back up, to recognize. And so, I'll tell you what, some marketers are very self-aware and they realize their weaknesses. Most don't. Most don't. Same with humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As so, if they're <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but, you know, just in life, right? Like some of us know, like, you know, I go to bed at night and I know what my weaknesses are and I wish that, you know, and I try to work on them and you got to be honest with yourself and self-deception is one of the national pastimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yeah, you know, something you said, Paul, really, uh, rang up you know sparked something in me which is that idea of drilling down and drilling down it's almost like we in the agency are at the in the in the crossfire of two different mentalities right there's this kind of mentality that wants everything to be solvable logical and answerable where and in that world there's a cause and effect if i say x consumer is going to respond to y and then creativity is the side of randomness chaos um entertainment um memorability like these things that are not formulaic and so the agency is kind of caught in the middle between this client that wants the world to be a certain way and the creatives and 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 the truth is and i think that paul feldwick's whole book you know both of his books are about this is about how does advertising really work None of us knows. We have theories about how it works. Um, you know, there's the sales, you know, salesmanship in print, like that's a model. And there's the, you know, fame generating, which is the Bob Hoffman, you know, uh, you know, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. But nobody really knows, you know, and so you end up with things like Tony the Tiger, who has sold a shit ton of breakfast cereal. But if you look at it through the cold lens of analysis, why a tiger and why the orange and blue and why the this? No reason. It just is. And it, it's something that worked. Well, OK, let's pick on Tony the tiger for a moment. Let's break crack that open a bit. Don't you believe that it worked because of some combination of alliteration, massive amounts of dollars spent, and consistency, and a sales strategy that made sure it was at eye level in every grocery store. 
Absolutely. And what Byron uh, Sharp, what Byron Sharp would call mental availability. I mean, I've become a huge advocate of this. This guy. <laughs> understand that we don't know how it works, but we pretty much suspect we know. And we can't take a scientific method and break it down the way you could a uh, chemical compound. No, we can't do that. But I think there's a lot to what you've just said, Paul. There's this gut sense, which is which is like you know. In 2005, I recall reading a study in the Harvard Business Review that quantified for the first time how, how um, the emotional connection to a brand translates into brand loyalty. Something that every creative knows or, or in a gut level knows it's like, if you're, there's no connection to the brand but with, a, with an emotion with how you feel about it, you're not gonna care about it. We've known that for decades, but we had no information, no research, nothing quantifiable to prove that until this Harvard Business Review article 15, 20, 20, 25 years ago, 20 years ago came out. But that, that just helps us prove our point, even though we knew this in a gut level. I, I, I don't think there's, it doesn't bother me that we can't explain why it works. We have evidence, it's called sales, it works. We know it works and, and that beautiful, innocent, genuine humanity of, feeling something without analyzing it is what most of us do most of the hours are awake yeah but when another human being says that's not enough i need to be able to defend it that's when you have to quantify it. and i get it i've had it all the time and that's why often i usually say no into an opportunity if they're not going to be human about it and trust that mysterious human thing life's too short i don't want to work on it it's not going to be fun for me so i don't do it yeah yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, what is your sense working with the the clients that you have had great deal of success with, Paul? What is your sense of their? Have you changed their perception of what this brief is supposed to be? Almost always, yeah. Did they? Did Did you have to? Did you have to uh, struggle with them to change their perception of what this? If I'm a persistent bugger. <laughs> well, I think your track record kind of speaks to that. Mm. And do creatives like working with you? Oh, yeah. Because you see, when you, mm. when you narrow down the brief, in this case, or the idea of the marching orders really, really tight, you actually liberate. Mm. Yeah, I think they call that... Uh, liberating constraint yeah yeah we'll the, see. there we'll, the, we'll make it intellectual fine that's fine yeah the point is when people know it and they say yeah i get it then okay then let me know if you get in, stuck in the weeds and read back to me but when someone can imagine it yeah 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 <laughs> one of my favorite books oh cool i, I have many favorite books so yeah. i the point they're is all my, they're all my favorites <laughs> that, that that constraint that liberates it's just you can see when the when the creative team is like, yeah, okay, yeah, well, yeah, we'll work on it. And wait, wait, you don't really get it, do you? Well, no, not really. Let's start over. Do you know this person? All right, let's get out there and know this person. You know, I mean, immerse yourself in it so it feels as close to you as possible, or find the you that's in it. You have to really know it. And then the idea is, unless someone is not qualified, and that happens sometimes. The idea should just be going boom, 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 boom. Great idea. Another great idea. Pretty good idea. Scary idea. Should be flowing. And if they're not, you got the wrong people, the wrong agency, the wrong project. That should be the way it is because that's how my life is. Yeah. I, I've heard that from creatives. The ones who've taken my workshop, they'll say, you know, I know when I get a bad brief, I can't always explain why it's a bad brief. I just know because I've sat there for a half an hour or 45 minutes listening to them walk me through it and explain. And at the end of the briefing, I say, Okay, so what is it you want me to do? On the other hand, if it's a good brief, whether it's a sentence long or three pages, you can tell when a creative gets it because the creative starts ideating it's on it right away. It's got to be a great ad for the creative team, just like a great yeah. ad for the public. It's got to be right. like, I hadn't thought of it like that before. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Well, I don't believe they did that. Wow, I'm not going to forget that. Same. My, my joke, the joke that I always tell is, you want to make money off a creative team, bring them to a poker game because they have no poker face. We, we wear our emotions on our sleeve. 
Yeah. And that's how you can tell when you have a, a good brief. If you have a good brief, they'll just, they can't help but start ideating. Well, I do know so, you created with people who are very skilled actors too. Yeah, yeah. But if it's a bad brief, they'll just, they'll, they'll roll their eyes and they'll start complaining. Creatives love to complain. We love to complain. Like little children who tell yeah. you what's going on about yeah. anything. Henry, you've got, to, you've got to confirm that working with your creative department, they'll complain. Yeah, I mean, it, when there's more, not that there's questions, when, when there's certain types of questions creatives will ask at the end of a brief that lets you know that you bombed and you, 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 didn't, you didn't do your best. Um, sometimes that's because you didn't put enough care and dedication into the brief and sometimes frankly it's because your hands were tied like a lot of the assignment already came basically pre-masticated from mm -hmm. the client and, and i'm just the messenger i'm bringing like this shit sandwich to them and saying we all got to take a bite and um there's nothing worse than that like they can sense that i'm not inspired and therefore they're not going to be inspired but you, but you know remember what cameron day said about that he said there's nothing wrong when you have a project there's nothing wrong with hitting doubles i mean i as a former creative i always wanted to hit a home run i'm sorry for the baseball analogy but it's just simple i always wanted to hit a home run i couldn't always hit a home run it wasn't going to be possible to hit a home run because of the circumstances you've just described henry but i cameron said something that i and i never thought about it before See, i'd rather I mean, ball trick than a home run say it again I'd rather have a hidden ball trick than a home run. <laughs> okay. Well, the other thing that, that Cameron shared with us was his son, who's now a, a fairly new copywriter. He's, I think he's 30, 30 yeah. some odd years old. He got his first job at a major agency. And they, father and son talk. And, and, and Cameron told us, I think he told us in the, in the, in the podcast, he said that um, he got a call from Cam2, Cam2 and said, I, you know, the client that I'm working on, all she wants is puns. She's like, I, I don't want to do puns. And his dad said, give her puns and she'll love you. You can crank them out in 20 minutes or an hour or, or whatever. And he, and he said, okay. And he did that. And that's exactly what happened. She said, I can count on Cam. He delivered for me. Um, and it didn't, it didn't require an awful lot of energy on Cam's part. So it's something cool. You got to do puns. All right, I'm going to write the most ordinary, logical thing, but use the most outrageous puns to do it. Well, I don't know exactly. Cam didn't share with us what the outcome was. But the point sandwich uh, thing, the best one of my favorite Jay Shy quotes is when they were having a bad year. And he said, we may not have to bite the bullet, but we will have to suck on it a little. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. Thank you, Jay. So, so what, what that's, that brings up an interesting question for a guy who, who has, I mean, a high, I think a high creative standard uh, from what I've gathered talking to you, Paul, do you accept the, the, the doubles that you sometimes are, would be required to hit, or do you just pass on those? If it's got to be a double, it's got to be a double like no one's ever seen before. Yeah. You're like me then. It's like, it's going to be a home run, but it'll only be a double. Can you tell I'm an optimist? Yes. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I know there are a lot of copywriters, probably art directors too, but I know a lot of copywriters who are filled with angst and that's their worldview. And that's if you think a ball over the shortstop's head, you can run to first base backwards. Okay. That's an optimist. Yeah. Smile. Yeah. Right. If you can hit that perfect shot. The center fielder can't get to it, and it's over the head yeah, of the shortstop. You know, and when you hit it, and you know it's only going to be a one bagger, yeah. you can run backwards. That's not illegal, and the fans will like it. Right. So, what's your sense? What's your sense of uh, training? We, Henry and I love to talk about the lack of skills and the dearth of training that's going on out there. What is your What is your take on that? It's got to be great work and find out backwards. If you are trying to teach people how to do a brief, you got to teach them why the brief. I don't give a shit about briefs if the work isn't good. And if you got a great brief and bad work, someone's got to be fired over that. So we find really great work. And if you can find the brief, great. If not, take great work and write the brief from it. 
what would the, the brief that you think would have led to that? That's a great okay. exercise. A reverse engineering exercise. Yeah, but take yeah, I, really, I really strange, unusual, fantastic work and maybe some boring, you know, have fun. Take the most boring work and say, was there a brief? What do you think it was? Make the logo yeah. bigger. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I've done that. I do that a lot. Get them to, to look at existing work based on your understanding of marketing and advertising. Can you figure out the brief? Well, so I, I depersonalize that because people, creative people take everything personally. So do what you can to depersonalize and opens it up. It's like when I meet with a CEO about where I want to take them. The first thing I do is I don't talk about their brand. Ooh, no, 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 no. Hmm. I'll ask them, what's the last major purchase you bought? Talk about that. And then talk about, hey, did you see the new Nike, uh, the new play? I think it's really cool. What do you think? And to start gauging their taste level about other things. And really smart ones know what I'm doing and they go along anyway. But I just get their mind loosened up without thinking about their business because that's so personal and ego and fear and anxiety creeps in. Just loosen up and find out what they like because then I can use that against them if I have Henry, to. Henry, you talk about that a lot. It's important for you as a, especially in a new agency uh, client relationship to get a real sense from the client what do they think good work is? What do they, what, you know, what is their idea of creativity? Yeah, I think that that's one of the, the big glaring blind spots in our industry is that a client will engage in an RFP, uh, invite 20 agencies to participate, narrow it down to five, hear presentations, um, you know, look at creative choose an agency, come up with a compensation plan. And at no point in time is there ever a conversation about this is our philosophy on creative um, or the agency asking, what is your philosophy on creative so that we can know and be on the same page? Um, it, it never happens. It's kind of this taboo, unspoken thing. And to me, it's that's the reason why that client is going to be in three years having another RFP. Because they never agreed at, at the onset of this marriage, they never agreed what the role like, hey, I want to have kids, I don't want to have kids. What do you think about religion? What do you, you know, who's going to, who's going to wash the dishes and who's going to cook like those things were never addressed before the marriage. So it's no surprise that we have all this divorce in the agency world in terms of uh, clients looking for looking around for something new. It's um, a point of time, but it's quills out, but most agencies still say, Kitty, kitty, kitty. Yeah, yeah. You know why? It, 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 it really boggles the mind that we we're our business is producing creativity, and we never have a heart to heart with the CMO with some with that decision making person. Because, like you said, you could you do the RFP with all the mid level people and the consultants and the this and the that. But the CMO, if they, if the CMO doesn't have a vision that he or she can articulate about hey, I want to do outrageous things with this brand to get us noticed. Or I have a very uh, conservative approach. I'm, I want to win with media and with having the right message. That are, you know, that different types of agencies. There are agencies that will do your outrageous stuff. There's agencies that are going to get optimize your media dollar there, you know, but you're never going to know if the match is right unless you have that conversation. So, Paul, you started off before we hit the record button. You were telling telling me before Henry uh, joined us that you're getting ready to depart and move to the Netherlands. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Well, like any good American when I was a kid, what did I know about that country? Windmills, tulips, uh, wooden shoes. Well, in 1974, the World Cup, when I saw these tall, long-haired guys in bright orange, and orange was my favorite flavor of all the Jolly Alley oranges and all the other things that, you know, you could eat as a kid. I thought, I'm attracted, like orange. And then, you know, high school, beyond, maybe something filters in from a magazine you read that, oh, they're hippies over there, or they smoke pot or, or whatever. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then in university years, uh, when I started pursuing the art history classes and whatnot, down here, are most of my art books. And over the years, let's see, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Van Eyck, Van Gogh. Um, they're, all, they're all Dutch. 
and Flemish and Bruegels and all that. It's like tap, tap, tap. Hmm, what's going on here? Well, by the time we're in the age of the internet, you can start looking at things. And because um, I don't have any biological children, at least as far as I know, and in this country, as you age, you really need to have a lot of money because healthcare costs, if you have parents that are still alive, you know, go like that. You need more money at the end of your life than you do at the beginning of your life, believe it or not. And I started thinking this country is never going to be a democratic socialist country. So that's what I need. And if you know what democratic socialism is, well, if you don't, then you probably quit the video right about now. I looked at the usual suspects in Northern Europe, Norway. Oh yeah, but I know some Norwegians I love, but they're not very huggy. I'm more of a Mediterranean emotionally, you know, because my Italian side uh, from my mother's side and my Scottish side, from my father's side. So with Denmark and then I was like, no, the Netherlands, what's going on there? Let's look a little deeper. And I researched and I researched and the trips I've made there confirm it's not a picture postcard place. It's not perfection. Actually, Amsterdam is a city that's constantly being renovated and renewed. There's noise everywhere, but you won't find a crack or a pothole anywhere for very long. That's really important. So I go deep into what their actual problems are, what they debate about. And I'm so willing to trade up for their problems versus the problems we have here. I love everything about everything Dutch. And it's one of my latest obsessions. My life has been a series of obsessions. This is the obsession that's going to move me. Well, that's a, an amazing story. And Paul McFarlane, we are grateful that you took the time to join us for this episode of the Brief Brothers. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure, an absolute deep, genuine pleasure to be with people who can be conversant, thoughtful and deep about the subject of what it is that we seem to want to do in this world and doing in a way that will be fun and profitable and wonderful for everyone. Last question. Where were you on July 20th, 1969? <laughs> Standing in front of a Zenith 17 inch black and white television set with rabbit ears and tinfoil and listening to Howard K. Smith. I see the guy. Yeah, that's what I was doing. I was 13, 12, 13. Yeah. My WashU connection, Howard K. Smith had a brother, Norris K. Smith, who was my favorite professor at WashU, who taught art history. Wow. I, uh, I was a six-month, seven-month fetus in my mom's belly. <laughs> so. I was at summer camp. That's good wish. Summer camp. Yeah, <laughs> I'm at summer, summer camp. Thanks so much, Paul. This has been great. I'm glad we were able to connect. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Ibach, and together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time, bye-bye.